Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have the pleasure of having Mr. Raphael Sheck here tonight, and he's going to be talking about Europe in 1820. And I am just going to turn it right over to him and let him go. So thanks for joining us, and I hope you enjoy tonight's lecture. Thank you all for joining. Thank you to the Waterville Historical Society for hosting this event. Um, I am uh, teaching modern European history at Colby College. Modern European history roughly defined as 18th century to the present. And I was asked to talk specifically about uh, Europe at the time when Maine um, became a state. Um, I will focus first on the connections, because um, there are connections between Maine and Europe in 1820. And the biggest um, framework for Maine and Europe is that they belong to a larger Atlantic world. The Europe and the US are still strongly connected less than four decades after American independence. And in this Atlantic world, or at least in the North Atlantic uh, section of it, Britain is still the main connecting um, factor through its maritime power, um, through its presence in Canada and the Caribbean. Britain, of course, also has a strong Mediterranean and a strong South Asian presence and African presence to some extent. So it's a, a global empire and uh, connects um, many, many different places, but it is still preeminently a European power. Maine statehood came about in the context of this uh, Atlantic world framework because um, Maine statehood came about in many ways as a long-term effect of the so-called War of 1812, um, an American-British war that is, of course, a misnomer because it really lasted much longer than just 1812. But um, what happened in Europe at that time was very closely connected to this war. The fact that um, most of continental Europe was under French rule at this time, that Napoleon was uh, readying himself for an invasion of Russia and was marching into Russia in the summer of 1812, meant that um, uh, British forces were significantly diverted from um, the North Atlantic and um, certainly lowered the inhibition for the United States to enter a war um, with Britain, since Britain would have to fight basically with one hand tied behind its back, um, looking at um, Napoleon and Europe. Um, Europe in 1820, is still reeling from the legacy of the revolutionary and Napoleonic um, period. If we look at um, uh, the continent of Europe in 1820, we have to consider it is still recovering from 23 years of almost constant warfare. The French um, revolutionary government had declared war on um, uh, first um, uh, Austria and, and later Prussia and England. Um, in uh, 1792, and from then on, um, 23 years of almost constant warfare, warfare occur in Europe um, involving almost every region of the continent, leading to between 3 and 6.5 million deaths, mostly military. The military deaths are a little bit easier to estimate because um, the military usually had uh, lists of uh, numbers of recruits. Um, so there were between two and a half and three and a half million um, military deaths. But at this time, and also for the centuries before, every army that moved through a certain region brought death and disease in its wake because um, you're still dealing with economies, with agricultural economies that are operating at subsistence level. So that means that um, any place where there's a lot of farmland is um, able to just produce enough food to maintain the local population. But when you have an army, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people marching through that area, trampling down the fields, eating up the local resources, this inevitably wipes out a lot of the population in the trail of these armies. 
And um, not only is a famine a consequence of this, but for those poor people who don't die um, through famine, very often disease is a big killer because, um, of course, these um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of men bring all sorts of diseases in their wake. And um, so the civilian death toll is very difficult to estimate. Some people put it as high as um, uh, 3 million, which would combine 6.5 million deaths with the uh, high number for the military losses. The um, a big winner of the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars is Britain. There's no question um, Britain is economically and in terms of empire clearly the strongest power. You could go so far as to say that in um, 1820 there's only one world power, there's only one superpower and it is Britain. It is economically very, very strong, um, partly through its uh, naval strength, through its global empire, and it has benefited from the Napoleonic Wars in many different ways. One of them is that um, the uh, revolution and Napoleon stifled economic development on the continent. Napoleon cut off the economic ties to Britain in order to bring Britain to the peace tables after having been defeated um, in the naval battle at Trafalgar, 1805. So Napoleon separates um, the continent of Europe from Britain and that ends up hurting the continent much more than it hurts um, Britain. Britain develops markets and uh, resources outside of the European continent and emerges much, much stronger, whereas um, uh, the continent of Europe is really held down and, and uh, more backward after um, this period. Europe in 1820 is still coming to terms with the ideas that have influenced the French Revolution. They have spread. They are present in many different countries, not only in those occupied by the French, also in other countries such as Britain itself, but these ideas are present in a very ambiguous way. And I'm going to go into more detail um, in a moment. Europe in 1820 is also seeing um, clear signs of the Industrial Revolution. This is happening above all in England and Wales, has been happening um, for probably about half a century, maybe a little bit more, depends on how one um, defines it, but, um, and, and therefore some people object to the term revolution because this is really a long-term process of incremental change. But by 1820, there's only one country in the world that is um, uh, on the way to becoming fairly industrialized, and that's Britain. And um, the Industrial Revolution is only very, very slowly spreading to some areas in Western Europe, predominantly Belgium in the 1820s, and um, to some extent um, North America and the United States, northern United States mostly, but um, this is still going to take quite some time. For, for the nearer and middle future, Britain is going to be the only major industrial um, power. So um, let's look a little bit more at the legacy of the French Revolution. The French Revolution provides a lot of uh, great promises. It's a big challenge to absolutism. The French um, revolutionaries are tired of uh, being ruled by an authority that claims that derives its power from God or from tradition. They challenge this. They point out that every human being, um, by virtue of being a human being, has access to reason and therefore has certain guaranteed natural rights. The natural rights idea, very important, um, it gets developed um, in France and northern Italy and some German lands and in England in the 18th century is crucial for um, the American Revolution and then also crucial for the French Revolution. Um, the rights of man, um, here on the uh, left of the slide, you have um, and this, uh, the, the, a tableau with this in, uh, uh, shown in France at the time. Um, the rights of man, um, as some uh, feminist observers um, say with uh, good reason, it's not very good, not very specific on the rights of uh, women. And um, that becomes a major issue throughout the 19th century and beyond. Um, one big promise of the French Revolution is also, or one big um, 
innovation is that there should be constitutions. The, the rulers should not be arbitrary in the way they rule. They should be tied to a constitution, to a, um, a treaty, basically, with the population. However you understand this, usually this meant with the, uh, the rich people, the rich male population. But um, the, the rulers should not be um, absolute. They should be tied to a constitution, and they should be tied in some form to a parliament. However you elect that parliament, that's a bit totally different question. Um, this doesn't need to be a democratically elected parliament at all. This can be a parliament that is um, elected among a small circle of notables. Um, that's all to be determined. And the French Revolution goes through various stages in which um, this idea changes. But um, the principles that there should be constitutions and parliaments, that's a big legacy and a promise of the French Revolution. The French Revolution abolishes feudalism as well. Very important for the mass of the population in continental Europe. Um, they are all, in many ways, I mean, feudal peasants, um, they are all tied to certain services that they have to perform to a local landlord. Why? Well, this goes back to very, very long time, to the late phase of the Roman Empire, and it initially was meant to be a trade that um, local peasants would, in exchange for having the right to take refuge in the castle of a nobleman, would pay that nobleman a certain amount of produce from their own land and would also, basically through a labor tax, perform certain um, numbers of days of labor on the nobleman's land. The system still exists. Um, it's very, very old. It's um, written down in old treaties. And um, the um, aristocracy has, of course, um, in the course of modernizing, centralizing states, has lost that um, ability and that inclination to protect um, local um, people. So their part of the deal is long gone. But the um, obligations, the obligations of the peasant populations are st still remaining. The French Revolution just declares um, no to feudalism, does not accept it anymore, abolishes it in a um, somewhat riotous um, process at the very beginning of the revolution in um, 1789. And the final big promise is French Revolution looks, uh, comes across as enlightened, as rational, it is uh, promising a rational, a centralized administration. Um, the French uh, begin to introduce the metric system. Napoleon, when he conquers so much of Europe, exports the metric system, um, which greatly facilitates trade because um, for a long time it had been the point of pride of every single little local authority to have its own measurements, its own weights and measurements. And you can imagine that um, this was not very conducive to trade. But the pr pr uh, promises of the French Revolution have to be contrasted with the trauma. The revolution is not only something that brings um, progress, that brings um, uh, hope. Um, the revolution, one can say, derails, although that would assume that it uh, could have continued in a kind of more orderly fashion. Um, that would be very debatable. But the revolution becomes increasingly radical. And from 1791 on, um, persecution of uh, dissenters and then outright terror become characteristic for it. Um, there's a caricature here on the slide um, that's uh, Le Réveil du Tiers État, the third estate. So basically, the commoners are waking up. And in the background is the Bastille, of course, which was stormed in uh, um, uh, July. Um, 1789, and um, the people here who are so afraid are the nobility with the big black hat and the clergy with the black attire. So, um, and indeed, um, they have a lot to fear from this because by 1791, um, the new revolutionary French state has basically appropriated a lot of the church lands, is beginning to um, tie the clergy into the state apparatus, which leads to a big religious schism um, of those uh, Catholics who are loyal to the Pope and those who are loyal to the French uh, state. 
and this uh, promotes civil war within France. Um, in um, 1792, um, the crowds of Paris storm the local assembly. Um, the crowds um, cut off the head of the president of the assembly, put it on a pike, and um, balance it in front of the other deputies and say, we want um, a republic, we want uh, the monarchy to be gone, death to the king. And um, these crowds do then convince the assembly to depose the king, make France a republic, um, and uh, to execute the royal couple, first the king and then the queen in 1793. So many people in Europe outside of France and also inside of France are horrified by these burning castles, these destroyed churches. Um, many people go into exile, the nobility in particular, many of the clergy, and the so-called nationalization of property, um, the state just taking over, dissolving and taking over all these monasteries, these church lands, um, despite its own um, constitutionally guaranteed rights of property. Um, this leaves um, uh, quite a, a trauma. Here's some pictures um, to illustrate this. Um, the um, abolition of feudalism in 1789 is misleadingly called the Great Fear um, because the peasants basically acted, um, they were prom prompted by rumors. It was almost as if uh, Today, somebody said that Martians have landed in Kansas and uh, they're taking over. Peasants have these rumors about um, saints and the devils have, having, having done certain things. And then they do something, however, that is politically very rational. They storm the castles and they burn the feudal records. So they send a very strong message to the government in Paris. We are sick and tired of feudalism. We are sick and we're not exactly enslaved, but we are sick and tired of um, simply by being who we are in our estate, having all these obligations, these labor obligations, these uh, um, tax obligations to these aristocrats who do nothing for us, really. And um, this also, but, but the violence in this context also leaves a very bad taste. And of course, here, the, the um, uh, storming of uh, the royal palace, um, Louis the Sixteenth, they are being apprehended by um, the crowds and then um, being uh, sentenced to death and guillotined um, on the, the left. So this violence leaves a very bad uh, taste. And many people in Europe and outside of Europe look at the French Revolution with a great deal of ambiguity. The French Revolution has huge military consequences. And uh, without these, um, France might not have been able to take over so much of the European um, continent. In 1792-93, um, the um, French army begins to totally reorganize itself. They have to because all of their officers are aristocrats. You cannot become a higher officer without being an aristocrat. And many of these aristocrats, of course, are now very threatened and they're fleeing. They're going away. They're running away from the country. So the French army has to radically reorganize itself. And the revolution appeals to the citizens to basically create a popular army, a levy en masse, so mass levy with these commoners coming together, and they fight. And they fight really well. They fight with a vengeance because they have a cause to fight for, very different from the opposing armies that are still partly relying on mercenaries who are businessmen, don't want to really fight. They want to make money and loot, plunder, so if they conquer a city. Um, but uh, they don't really have much of uh, an interest in, in who is winning as long as they get paid. And then many of these armies that oppose France are armies with peasant recruits. So there are peasants in there who are doing this military service because they have to. This is part of their obligation, like they have to pay a certain labor tax to the landlord um, or, and, and also some of their produce. They also have to serve in their armies, often under the command of their local landlords. And, and they're not very motivated. They don't have anything to fight for in this. So um, France becomes militarily very successful and begins to uh, gradually conquer more and more of continental Europe. And in the process, it begins to export these revolutionary ideas. So 
It creates first these sister republics in the, the low countries, in Switzerland, in Western Germany, and in Northern Italy. And then it uh, uh, creates all sorts of new states under Napoleon that in many ways feature these central ideas of the French Revolution, bring constitutions, bring the metric system, bring um, the idea of rational, non-clerical government, and so on, lead to enormous, enormous territorial changes, totally change the map of Europe. Napoleon, in particular, he's like a plow going through a field in many different directions, and the borders change every year. Um, gets uh, absolutely uh, dizzying um, if you try to um, follow this. So these are the military consequences. But then, of course, um, Napoleon gets defeated um, after invading um, Russia. And uh, Napoleon leaves a problematic legacy. For some Europeans, he is a romantic and a hero and um, symbol of masculinity, this um, big romantic hero who fails like a romantic hero should fail somehow, but um, who is fighting for a wonderful cause and is fighting for an ideal. And even if the cause isn't so wonderful, um, he is still a, a romantic and masculine hero. Um, for the French, he becomes a symbol of French national glory. Napoleon gets defeated and banned in 1814, um, but only to the island of Elba, which is not very far from the French coast. He manages to slip away, and he basically organizes a triumphal march all the way up to Paris. Many, many uh, French people cheer um, when they see him coming. Um, he's a symbol of uh, great uh, French national um, glory. Um, he is very interesting politically because he is an advocate of universal suffrage. He wants every French man, not women. He's, he's very, um, I, I should say, chauvinist. He doesn't think women should have a political voice. He, he's really much more um, conservative in that sense than the French Revolution itself even was. But um, he wants universal suffrage for men. He wants that everybody above a certain age can vote and can vote with equal voice. Um, in some other countries, many people can vote, but their vote then doesn't count as the same as the vote of a rich person. So um, this property-based suffrage versus um, universal, more or less democratic suffrage. But Napoleon, and of course this sounds terribly modern if you look at um, some states such as uh, Russia today, um, Napoleon will make sure that the parliament that gets elected through this universal suffrage does not have much power. So um, this modern idea um, gives the people the feeling that they are voting, um, control public opinion, use censorship, use police repression to ensure that you get the result that you want in the elections and make sure that the parliament that uh, you have elected really doesn't um, have much power and doesn't have much independence. Um, but there are also some uh, interesting and, and fascinating things about him. Um, one of them is that he exemplifies the rise through merit, that he, he is an aristocrat, that's important, but he is from the Corsican aristocracy. He is from the very low aristocracy in a territory that had become French just a year before his birth in uh, 1768. It was uh, a, an island that had been governed by uh, Genova, the Italian city. And he would never have risen to the um, uh, big commanding military post that he gained in um, the late 1790s if it hadn't been for the French Revolution. So he um, uh, mer he exemplifies that rise through merit. But he's also a brutal oppressor in much of Europe with his endless wars and um, with his um, uh, repression of trade. He uh, creates a lot of counter push. He spurns basically nationalism, national resistance in um, places such as Italy and Germany. And uh, it's a nationalism that often is kind of tied with conservative causes. Um, it's easy to exploit sometimes by conservative aristocrats. And the, the recruitment drives are just incessant. Um, he can't find any uh, 
recruits in France anymore. Um, there's this uh, epidemic going around in France um, in um, like in the late 1800s, or maybe before 1810, where um, all these young uh, guys in the villages don't have any front teeth anymore. Very strange. Well, the, uh, the story behind it is that in order to serve in the army, you need your front teeth because the way they shoot, they need to bite open the cartridges before putting them into the gun. And if you don't have any front teeth, you are militarily useless. So a lot of young French guys basically go to somebody who looks pretty much like a football player in America and say, um, can you please punch me in the face? And then afterwards say, thank you and they can stay home, yeah. Well, the effect is that um, Napoleon drafts more and more non-French people into the um, uh, French army. So the army that invades Russia in 1812 is 600,000 men strong. Of these, only 200,000 are French. And French here, that means a lot because the French have annexed so much of uh, um, uh, uh, Central Europe at this point and time and Southern Europe um, that, there, that many of these people would not be, have been considered French in uh, 1792 before these wars started. Um, very large, large contingent of Germans, uh, Swiss, Italians, Poles, even Spaniards, Dutch, um, Belgian people, and so on. Um, so the majority of his uh, Grand Armée, of his Grand Army that invades Russia, is not even um, French. So that about Napoleon. Now. After Napoleon, the um, uh, statesmen of Europe meet in Vienna and they try to put the pieces back together. The leading statesman is actually a German Rhenish uh, Count, uh, Metternich. At this time, you basically, I mean, uh, the Austrian king will hire um, whoever is suitable as a, a prime minister and whoever has um, high aristocratic pedigree. That's very important. but. Um, this um, uh, German nobleman is not even really from Austria, but um, he gets hired by Austria and he serves it as prime minister. And he is the big power broker at this uh, international conference, puts a lot of emphasis on international security, tries to balance um, the powers, allows France to remain a great power, but makes sure that um, France gets somewhat contained so that it cannot again expand that easily as it had in the 1790s. But also one important point of the Metternichian or the Vienna system is that the uh, great powers of Europe are supposed to collaborate against revolution. And when they say revolution, they mean all sorts of things. They mean nationalism. Nationalism is seen as a revolutionary force because it's about the people, or it seems to be about the people at this time. Um, it's also um, against liberalism, against the idea that rulers have to concede parliaments and constitutions and um, adhere to the human rights idea. That's also not um, uh, widely accepted among the ruling heads of Europe. And definitely it is against democracy. Um, democracy is exact, in the minds of most people at the time, democracy is the French Revolution at its worst. The uh, crowds that uh, impose political correctness, that hang um, somebody on the lantern just because of the kind of pants that that person is wearing and that seem to identify that person as an aristocrat. There's a famous case where a French actor gets um, sentenced to death and guillotined because in a play he said, long live the king. Now, this was his line because it was actually Calderon, a Spanish play from uh, 16, 1630s, I think. And he said on stage in the play, long live the king, because that's what his character had to say. Well, he was grabbed and he was put in front of a revolutionary tribunal and executed because he had praised the king. So um, this is what people associate with democracy in um, the 1810s um, and uh, 20s. So um, the Congress of Vienna is a gathering of kings and of their ministers, a picture here. And um, it estab they establish this map of Europe. The typical fashion is that they really don't bother to ask anybody. 
whether they want to be in that country or in another country. Um, they look at the map of Europe, they draw borders, they mitigate um, claims, they mediate claims, but they do not care about what the people feel in the areas which are um, divided, which are apportioned to um, certain um, states. That's not on their um, radar in 1815. So um, I want to briefly highlight the political positions in uh, Europe here in the restoration phase or after um, Napoleon. Um, on the very right, you have reactionaries. And are you already using the terms right and left? That comes out of the French Revolution, um, out of uh, 1790, roughly. Um, at the very right are reactionaries. And those are the people who really want to go back to the absolutist monarchy, who are ultra-royalist, who think that um, the people should not forget that monarchies are given by God, that rulers have God-given power. They want to restore absolutism. They want to roll the wheel back. Conservatives are kind of they're trying to preserve the status quo. They're willing to make compromises. Um, the French king who takes over after Napoleon, for example, he gives the constitution, he allows a parliament, he makes sure that only the richest people in the country can vote, gives quite a bit of power to the church, but this is very different. It's no longer quite an absolutist monarchy. He's, very, he's a conservative in that sense. Um, on the left, you have the liberals. They're sometimes called Girondins after the French Revolution. They stress freedom, the rights of man, limitations on the church, parliaments, parliamentary control. They want an enlightened justice. They often want a constitutional monarchy, sometimes a republic, but generally they're happy with a constitutional monarchy like in England. They want people to vote, but they want the vote to be weighed by property so that the rich people get to have a stronger vote than the poor people, and they want free trade. And at the very left are Democrats. They are basically about everything that the liberals want, but with one big difference. They want universal manhood suffrage that the liberals at this point do not want. Liberals look a little bit like this guy here from... Uh, a caricature by Honoré Daumier, um, famous French uh, caricaturist. Um, liberals are often businessmen, entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, they're, they're from the bourgeois group, so not nobles necessarily, although there are also some um, uh, noble liberals, but um, uh, generally they're uh, well-to-do. Um, as one of my history professors used to say, um, you can recognize 19th century liberal because he smells like French perfume. Now, I don't quite see how that works. Um, I don't think that the, these liberals smell like French perfume anymore, but um, maybe at the time they did. So conservatism is seemingly dominant, but it's also challenged. Um, there's a repressive atmosphere in uh, Britain. Um, there's a lot of labor unrest um, spurned by the early Industrial Revolution leads to um, a repression by the army in 1819 and a massacre that's um, um, cynically called the Peter Lowe Massacre, um, one of the industrial towns. There's repression in the German lands, the censorship through the so-called Karlsbad decrees. Um, you cannot advocate um, a national unity, for example. Um, you have to be very careful when you speak about um, human rights and democracy. Um, the Grimm brothers, fairy tale fame, um, uh, get on the wrong side of this. They, they, they get uh, banned and uh, um, imprisoned for a certain time um, because um, they are 19th century liberals and um, they do not adhere to these rules. Um, France is uh, drifting from conservative to increasingly reactionary. Um, in the later 1820s, um, France has a king, uh, Charles X, who would really love to do away even with these limited concessions that his predecessor had put in place after Napoleon and restore a um, absolutist monarchy with very, very strong um, church power. Um, Russia and Prussia, very um, conservative states at the time, bulwarks of autocracy. There's a flicker of hope in Russia in December 1825, um, uh, basically a rebellion 
uh, that uh, is triggered by Russian officers who had been stationed in France and had come into contact with some of these um, ideas of the French Revolution, but that is quickly um, repressed by, 18, by the end of December 1825. So, but there are rising social tensions. There's the industrialization, the beginning industrialization creates um, these uh, so-called nouveau riche, the new rich people in France. Wealth and status um, do not always coincide. Some people become extremely wealthy, but they're not nobles. And um, this irks many of the traditional nobility who have associated their noble status with wealth, and that often doesn't work anymore. Um, many nobles remain wealthy, but other nobles um, uh, fall in the social ladder and um, uh, look um, with great concern at these uh, rich um, non-nobles. And then below, all of these people are the so-called, what the French call them, les classes dangereuses, the dangerous classes. So the working masses, people who are um, artisans who are in, in these uh, growing cities are going to um, these big workshops and this constant fear of revolution as in the picture here um, that they might take to the streets, erect barricade and start shooting and um, demand um, a revolution, demand a revision of the political process. So this all blows up in France and in some other countries as well in 1830 where um, Charles X, after three days of street fighting, um, decides to flee and uh, give up. Um, this famous picture there of uh, liberty leading the people with Notre Dame Cathedral in the background by David. And um, <clears throat> the revolution this time gets stabilized under a um, monarch who is also a liberal, um, who is a relative of the deposed um, dynasty um, so-called Louis-Philippe. Um, his father is the Duke of Orléans, and so basically member of the French royal family. Louis-Philippe decides to compromise with um, uh, the revolutionaries. Um, he creates a liberal monarchy with lower property qualifications for the vote, so he expands the, uh, the electorate, and um, he um, liberalizes the constitution, and um, the, uh, the, the political atmosphere in um, France, at least in the short run. Um, Charles X, here's a picture of him, had really tried to go back to the 18th century. Um, he had um, made this elaborate ritual about his coronation, and he had tried to revive an, uh, a medieval tradition where many people believed that the so-called royal touch had a healing power. So if the king touched a sick person, that a sick person would recover. So he tried to ritualize this in the framework of the coronation. And there were still people who believed in this. But you can imagine, after all that um, France has gone through during the revolution, um, this does not go over well in um, many circles and um, uh, helps to um, undermine his power. Here's a picture of Louis Philippe, or actually several pictures. Um, he, yeah, this liberal monarch who succeeds Charles X. Um, on the right is a caricature of him. He, he, he loved to eat and it showed, and he, his face um, was said to resemble a pear increasingly. So um, people uh, called him the pear, and the caricaturist um, tried to um, exemplify this here. So um, coming to uh, the end, I want to highlight a few cases where I mean, Maine secedes from Massachusetts, secedes in a peaceful way. But, and there are also many um, European states at this point who try to secede, who try to become independent, um, but usually not in a peaceful way. Um, Greece is one of uh, the countries um, that does actually win independence successfully, but at the price of almost 10 years of warfare, and uh, which elicits a lot of uh, solidarity, actually, both in Europe and also in America, including in Haiti, where, of course, the revolution in, um, in the late uh, uh, 1790s and then in 1804 had led to independence, um, the uh, president of Haiti sends a uh, letter to the leaders of the Greek liberation movement and wishes them success. 
It says, unfortunately, we are too poor to support you financially. But um, the US supports um, um, our rich donors in the US and in Britain and in Germany and in France um, uh, support uh, the Greeks. Um, there's a great, um, a, a great uh, wave of uh, Phil Hellenism, so admiration, love for Greece. Of course, Lord Byron goes there and uh, gets killed. And um, uh, actually, the largest number, I think, of foreign foreigners who went to fight for the Greeks um, and got killed were Germans, um, uh, ethnic Germans. Um, they were French, they were Italians, they were Swiss, uh, everything. So this um, uh, liberation struggle galvanizes much of romantic um, Europe. Um, Greece does win independence, but only with the help of the great powers. And it's uh, Britain, France, and Russia that intervene and uh, save um, the Greeks. They would have been repressed. They were repressed by the Ottomans and by their vassal Egypt by, um, after five years of fighting. Um, it's an incomplete liberation. Um, uh, only a minority of ethnic Greeks really um, is in that um, independent state of Greece. Um, um, the majority still live under Ottoman rule, but it is the creation of a new and independent, more or less independent state. Um, Serbia tries uh, to get independence as well um, in various uprisings against the Ottoman uh, rulers, also part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, it manages to establish autonomy um, by 1817. This autonomy gets um, recognized in 1830. It is not yet full independence. That's only recognized in 1878. But here, too, um, it uh, manages ultimately to become independent. Poland rebels against the Russian predominance in 1830, but unsuccessfully. They get repressed. They get crushed by the Russian army. Interestingly, one trigger was that the Russians attempted to raise a Polish army to repress the revolution in Paris. And this was totally OK. According to the Vienna system, um, the great powers of Europe had the, um, uh, they were allowed to and actually were expected to intervene against revolution in any country. So it was totally OK for Russia um, to send an army to march on Paris and destroy the revolution there. Um, the Russians actually did that in Hungary in 1849 when um, Hungary revolted against Austrian rule and the Austrians were not able to repress that uprising. It was the Russian army at the behest of the Tsar that invaded Hungary and restored order. Um, in both cases, um, and also in the case of Greece, um, religious factors play a major role. The religious differences, the Poles are Catholics, the Serbs are Orthodox, the Greeks, of course, too, are Orthodox, and that religious um, difference plays a major role. And to some extent, that's also true for Belgium, um, also a state that wins independence um, right in this context in 1830. Um, they had revolted already at the time of the French Revolution. Ironically, it was, was kind of a conservative revolt against um, the uh, very far-reaching progressive reforms of the Austrian emperor, uh, Joseph II. Um, but the Austrians had been able to repress this uprising. Belgium was then occupied by the French for a long time. It was constituted as one state with the Netherlands, but um, revolted against Dutch rule because it perceived these, this rule as too autocratic. Religious factors played a role. Belgians are predominantly Catholic. Dutch are Protestant and Catholic, but uh, Protestants a little bit prevailing. And um, here, too, like in the case of Greece, um, it took some uh, foreign intervention and international agreement um, to secure this independence. So, um, so several states, several European countries, actually, basically are born in the context, in the same context in which um, uh, Maine um, becomes um, a state. So I want to stop here um, and just um, this little hint here for the future is a caricature of Daumier. Um, with um, uh, Louis Philippe um, basically uh, riding the horse of uh, France um, to death under his big weight. And um, the question mark is time for the next revolution. Of course, that does break out in 1848, leads to 
um, democracy for a short time in France before then um, another Napoleon, nephew of Napoleon I, um, uh, basically uh, takes the revolution hostage and establishes a new empire and uh, uh, stops there too. But this is where I want to stop as well and answer questions or comments from the chat. So I had a question earlier on from Nancy Williams, um, a comment and a question. She said, Napoleon and the revolution reminds her of England's Oliver Cromwell and his army's rebellion against the crown and was wondering if anyone has ever compared the two leaders and those rebellions? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, there, there are comparisons. Um, they also extend to the military side of this. Um, Cromwell um, was also a very capable military leader. Um, Napoleon was likely a military genius, although he lost his touch in Russia. He became uncharacteristically hesitant in Russia in 1812. Um, there's a big difference insofar as um, Cromwell is, is really a religious fanatic. Napoleon is not. He's re religious cynic. He's really a religious cynic. He has read Rousseau, and um, he maybe he adheres to some kind of natural religious feeling. He is not at all averse to using religion if it advances his purpose, but he doesn't really believe in it. That's what I see as a big difference between Cromwell and Napoleon. And um, the context, I think, is also somewhat um, different. Cromwell, um, I think, never quite uh, gets the same um, uh, degree of, uh, of, of popularity and, and power that Napoleon has. Although Napoleon tries very much to think about the next step. And like Cromwell, too, he want, wanted to place a son on the throne and basically kind of reintroduce the inheritable monarchy through the back door. Certainly something that um, Napoleon tried as well. Um, but he was a very modern man in the way that he understood the dynamics of charismatic rule, of a rule that, like his own, like later on the rule of Hitler, for example, or even of Stalin, that's constitutionally on weak grounds and that rests on constant reaffirmation through popular success, through popular acclaim, military success, political success. Um, he felt that he, that's part why he didn't last, because he could have taken a compromise peace in 1813. Um, he had married. Who do you marry if you really want to be in the highest stages of European society? An Austrian princess. He was actually happy with her. They loved each other. It's very rare. Marriages were not, at that level, were not contracted for happiness. They were contracted for political purposes. But they really liked each other a lot and had fun time together. But um, he, he could have taken a compromise and um, uh, kind of tried to solidify his power, but he feels like he can't. He needs to constantly um, be successful, including military, militarily successful. If there are any other questions, you can post them in the chat. I'll give you just a couple minutes, and then if not, we're going to end our event. OK, I don't see any other questions. So uh, I would like to thank you for being with us. And uh, we thank you for hanging in there. And we will see you the next time. I'll be posting our next event as soon as I know what it is. So thanks for joining us. And everyone have a good evening.